wondered how we got There's so much to unpack. So as we honor our ancestors, let's take a step back to the struggles, the triumphs, and all the victory laps. History is critical in terms of understanding political science. As political scientists, you can't understand the present without knowing how the present arose. We have to partner with our historians to make certain that the story is told and that it is told right. History helps us to hopefully continually give us that warning signal like, hey, hey, this has happened before and we need to do our best you know, to not repeat the same mistakes. If you don't know where you've been, you won't know where you're going. And for us, it's important that we know the history so that we can tell the stories in ways that help to benefit our platforms. History is important, yes, but whose history is also as important? We cannot allow others to tell our story. So it's important that we exist in these spaces because a lot of the work that we are doing has real life consequences. Historically, you know, black political scientists were not, uh, I would say voices were not heard in the same way as white political scientists. There are narratives that simply aren't true and uh, we need more professors in the discipline of uh, political science and history to change those narratives. Stories of double consciousness. Double consciousness, uh, as Du Bois puts it, essentially means, you know, how we understand ourselves as Black people through our own unique lens versus how we understand ourselves as Black people kind of through the lens of white America. I also think it's important to understand the history of Uh we were born out of protest, sort of, uh, against the American Political Science Association. And what we found inside the APSA at this time was a, a, a shine away from putting at the forefront the issues and the concerns of African Americans in particular, but, but people of African descent, people of color in general. APSA would not recognize that a specific category of uh, study could be organized around the black experience. And therefore there were those within the organization who felt that in order to get this kind of scholarship out and to move forward, they had to leave APSA, which was very, very resistant uh, to talking about the black experience. When we started this organization in 1968, there were maybe 20 black people with PhDs in political science. Only five women. Now we don't even know the number because most of the people here have those degrees. When NCOPES was founded, it was largely founded among members who were at historically black colleges and universities. And we now know that many more of our members are at predominantly white institutions. And so we have to think about how does that then reframe the work of NCOPES, not necessarily the mission, because the mission remains the same. For those who don't know, there's beauty in resistance, and it's manifested through the work and responsibility of Black political scientists. The, the founder of our department, um, Dr. Mac Jones, you know, he was very clear, you know, on our responsibilities as Black scholars. The founding chair of our doctoral program at Clark Atlanta University who, by the way, was the founding president of the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, uh, Dr. Mac H. Jones. Um, many of us uh, uh, hold very dear to our hearts his important contribution to the discipline. And he's written extensively on what ought to be the responsibility of the Black political scientists to the community. As political scientists, uh, we're scarce resources of our community. And so uh, we need both to understand and be the voice of uh, our, our people's struggle. We need to be the chroniclers of our people's struggles. In addition to understanding a certain kind of, of reality, uh, it is the responsibility of the, uh, of the political scientists to the Black community to offer solutions, to offer some solutions, and to offer solutions that are grounded in the unique experiences of Black people in, in that given space. Black political scientists matter because we have a unique perspective. 
an educational system where black boys are suspended at rates that signal that they are disposable and black girls in South Carolina are flung around classrooms like rag dolls by security. We need more colleagues as well as students to pursue uh, PhDs so that they can, uh, you know, challenge the system. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you guys for joining us for the Founder Symposium. Um, I think I speak for us all when I say we're all super excited to kind of talk about uh, both of the scholars whose work, scholarship, and legacies are being honored tonight. Um, and we appreciate you guys for coming out as well. Um, and so as many of you know, the Founder Symposium is a scholarly showcase of graduate students in recognition of the transformative contributions uh, established senior and emeriti uh, ENCOVE scholars have made to the study and accessibility of Black politics within and beyond the academy. And so the two um, scholars who are being honored uh, tonight, whose work we are engaging with tonight, are two scholars whose uh, work I am incredibly inspired by, uh, Dr. Elsie Scott and Dr. Leslie Burrow McLemore. Um, and so just a little bit about both of these scholars, Dr. Elsie Scott, uh, her career spans across academic, public, and private sectors. She is currently the director of the Ronald W. Walters Leadership and Public Policy Center at Howard University, and has been a professor at several universities, including Rutgers University, uh, North Carolina Central University as well. Uh, Dr. Scott is the author of several articles on black politics, elections, and criminal justice, uh, her work, uh, she has worked as the CEO, Senior Vice President, Program Manager, and Consulting Consultant in the public and private uh, sectors. Her professional affiliations include the National Organization for Black Law Enforcement Executives, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, and the New York City Police Department uh, as well. And so she was also a past uh, INCO's president. And during her time, uh, she focused on expanding the organization's global reach. Dr. Leslie Burrow McLemore uh, is a civil rights activist and a political scientist. Uh, he, as a student, founded the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People at West College. He also organized uh, with the SNCC, uh, the Student Nonviolent Court, uh, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. He was a professor at Southern University before moving to Jackson State University where he founded the Political Science Department and the Fannie Lou Hamer Political Institute. Um, he is published in the areas of Southern, political, uh, Southern Black electoral politics and the civil rights movement um, and environmental politics. Dr. McLemore is a founding member of ENCODES and has served uh, as president from 1974 to 1976. He is also the first Black elected official in Walls, Mississippi, uh, where he serves as alderman. Um, and so we are very excited to engage with their work, but before we start, I want to allow the panelists to introduce themselves. Uh, for starters, I'm Kesia Dickinson. I am a uh, doctoral candidate at Michigan State University, um, and I will be moderating the conversation tonight. Um, next, we will have Jasmine introduce herself, then Michael, um, and then Kelly. Hello everyone, I'm Jasmine C. Jackson. I'm a PhD candidate at Purdue University. Um, my dissertation focuses on African-American political knowledge and trying to diminish uh, the racial gap in political knowledge between blacks and whites. Um, I'm an Americanist and I also focus on political behavior, political socialization. I'm Michael Strawbridge. I'm a third year PhD student at Rutgers. Uh, I I'm interested in black politics, obviously, and then um, quantitative methods uh, and political psychology broadly, and more specifically, I guess, uh, black political socialization. So this is obviously fun for me. All right, and hi everyone. My name is Kelly Richardson. I'm a PhD candidate at University of Florida. 
Um, my interests are in suburban politics, um, basically the intersection between urban and suburban politics. Um, I'm also very excited uh, to have this opportunity. So thanks, uh, Kesey, and the rest of INCOPS for allowing us uh, this opportunity. All right, so thanks you guys for agreeing to be panelists and we can kind of get started with the conversation. So first question or first uh, point of discussion. In her paper, The Politics of Police in the 1990s, Race-Related Issues, Dr. Elsie Scott draws comparisons between the riots in the 1960s and those in the 1990s, both of which grew from the Black community's frustrations with economic and uh, social conditions. Considering the social upheaval we experienced globally in the summer 2020 and beyond, what can we learn from her work as we reimagine the relationship between the Black community and law, and law enforcement? And we will start with Jazz, then go to Michael, and then Kelly. Thanks, Kesey. Um, so yes, yeah, so as we're looking at Dr. Uh, Elsie Scott's work, I think one of the first things that kind of jumped out to me is one of the things we can learn is just the importance of, of particular historical events that are currently still shaping uh, how we live today. And that, you know, I love how she opened the paper with um, the Kerner Commission, because this is, this is something that is very impactful on the Black community. And we don't necessarily teach it or, you know, people may not be as familiar with it as they should. And so as, as I was going through her paper and I was just kind of thinking about her paper as well as Dr. McLemore's looking at the Black Panther Party, uh, one of the things that kind of I, I want, I would think about reimagining is whether or not, um, whether or not we actually want to subject Black people to having to actually be a part of the police department. And so uh, she has a, she has a quote, uh, she has a quote from the commission, <clears throat> from the commission, and it says that the commission concluded that Black folks um, recognize, have come to recognize the police as a symbol of white power, white racism, and white repression, and um, that the police do also reflect white attitudes. So I kind of thinking about that, I, I don't necessarily think it's a good thing for us to subject Black people to that. Uh, and we just, the video was talking about double consciousness and just thinking about how, you know, is it a double or maybe even a triple consciousness associated with having to be a Black police officer? Um, and Dr. McLemore pushed us to think about the uh, the Black Panther Party and their 10 points. And in that point, those 10 points, they brought forward, they brought forward thinking about a community, a, a community policing organization that is essentially like for us, by us. And even if we were to do that, which I think would be a good idea for us to revisit as we're reimagining this relationship, we would have to think outside of what we know policing to currently be because of its ties to white supremacy, white racism, and white attitudes. We would have to come together as a community to really be able to figure out what is important for us to regulate within our own communities that may not be, um, may not align with what we currently know policing to be. So those were some of the points that I was thinking about and I'm trying to be mindful of time because I know we can talk about this all day. So I'm gonna pass this over to Michael. <laughs> Yeah, I think one of the main points for me is sort of when we talk about sort of immediate change versus long term changes and what that looks like. I think when they talked about sort of 1960s, you had the emphasis then on hiring the black police officers, then 20, 25 years later, they're up for retirement and you have this now big gap there of you're losing all this supposed black leadership that you instituted there and how hard that is to replace that and how it's about being attentive and you can't just make the immediate demands and then not follow up with them and not see that impact happen year after year and it becomes almost like a tokenism thing happening and even before 2020 we can look at 2014 with Ferguson uh Ferguson right and what happened there and the Ferguson report and the demands made and how quickly we had, you know, all the uh, the 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 DOJ report came out, and we saw everything that was wrong. And what did that follow up look like? You know, a couple of years later, they had the great reports come out of how well did Ferguson respond to uh, everything they were called out for being wrong about. And what we saw was they weren't actually able to make many of the uh, recommended changes yet. And 
those kind of reports are necessary every year. So you don't have situations like what Dr. Scott, you know, describes with you having this like, you know, just like backlog of a lack of officers, if that was the change you wanted to make there. So thinking about the long-term effects and almost like dog watching and monitoring is so important and not just the immediate, you know, demands. Yeah, and um, sort of building off of, you know, what everyone says so far that um, it was interesting that with the 2020 um, uprisings, uh, the officers were sort of faced with this idea of like Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter, you know, as if their uniform was the same as their uh, skin skin color, right? Um, so, but it also sort of highlighted, um, like Dr. Scott was saying in her piece back then, that these um, large police forces are sort of quickly getting less diverse and not really uh, looking like the communities uh, that they're in. Um, and so I thought when I was thinking about this, um, I started with what should the role of police officers be, right? So what is the role of an officer? Um, and sort of using the language of Angela Davis, uh, I noted that uh, policing should be about understanding and getting rid of the conditions that produce violence in individuals. Um, it should not only be about the sort of descriptive representation of the black officer, but it's still how well do they know the community and the people within their space. Uh, so sort of ensuring that those uh, are not, that those officers know who's in crisis within these communities and crisis, whether that be um, with their mental health, economically, or even physically, that they're being checked upon and given resources, right? Um, so the, essentially the goal of protecting and serving is directly embedded within the community work. Um, so it is sort of difficult um, in thinking about how these officers are sort of leaving the communities uh, or leaving policing um, and sort of thinking about what role do they have uh, within those same communities. Um, and also just sort of thinking about this in relation to my own research of if there are, a lot of African Americans uh, are leaving the urban core, all right, and maybe diving back into suburban populations. What does that mean for policing within the city there? Um, but these are all great questions that you know we're still grappling with today that uh, are highlighted um, within Dr. Scott's work. Yeah, I think one of the major points too was that right the comparison between the 60s and the 90s, and I would say even present day, is that there were social and economic issues that were unresolved. Um, and so these police shootings that she described in her paper, that Dr. Scott described in her paper, were just this uh, spark that ignited a situation or a frustration that was already growing. Um, and I think we could, you know, when during 2020 or the summer of 2020, we talked a lot and heard a lot about how black people were living in double pandemics. We had uh, the actual pandemic with COVID-19 going on, but also um, what we experienced with police violence. And I think one of the biggest things that I took away from Dr. Scott's uh, paper, but then also going through her blog and reading some of her blog posts were, was that policing is just like an element of all of these other issues that we have to solve. Um, and when it, as Kelly stated, violence is one of those things, but also housing security, uh, food insecurity, all of these other things that we need to solve. And so when police violence enters, it's just this, this spark that ignites this whole thing, so. Yeah, and even hearing you say that, Kesey, I was thinking about, uh, I was thinking about the fact that the video said, you know, like we have to think about history, but also it repeats itself and we need to learn from it. and and you know we like I say we're still really grappling with this but we've seen we we've literally seen um, a long track record because even before 2020 you had that summer I think I think it was the summer of about 2016 where there was uh, I specifically remember like it was like Corin Gaines died and then I would say around maybe um it was it was like several uh well, the young the the father that was killed selling the CDs outside of Louisiana outside of the store and then I would say Eric Gardner around that time as well. They were all they were all really congested and 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 even before that, thinking before the uh, 
the 90s and the 60s, then you had Red Summer. And I think once I said Red Summer was what, the 20s or so? Or, but Red Summer happened, there was all these string of violence in predominantly Black towns from, you know, white mobs. And also, you know, you have to think about it kind of how we think about the January 6th uh, insurrection. Sometimes the white mob are also the same people who police your communities as well. They just don't have on their uniforms at the time. And so, you know, we've, we've seen, uh, we've seen this over and over again. And, and, and it is a deeper problem. It is a very deep, it's a deeper problem and more complex problem than, than, I mean, we could spend the rest of our lives, our lives doing this. You know, we've seen Dr. Scott do it and she's, you know, and, and the work is there, but it is so complex because there are so many issues that impact us as black people that, I don't, I don't wanna be cynical, but we, we could do this forever. Cause like I said, the history, the history is there. All right, thank you guys for your response. We will move to the second question. Um, and also for the audience, if you guys have questions, you can place them in the Q&A. Um, our tech support, Angela, will be watching for those. You could also wait until the Q&A um, and we can invite you up to ask your question. Um, so the second question, um, in his paper, Black Political, Socializa Black Political Socialization and Political Change, Dr. McLemore discussed elements of the Black Panther Party platform as a model of radical political socialization. Could you speak more about what you believe he meant uh, or what Dr. McLemore believed was necessary to establish uh, to ensure all Black individuals achieve this revolutionary sense of purpose? And what did he mean by revolutionary sense of purpose? And is that still necessary today as we begin to reimagine strategies for Black liberation? Same order. So I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try and break these because you got three different questions here. So first, we have um, what was necessary to establish that all Black individuals uh, achieve a revolutionary sense of purpose. And I think one of the things that Dr. Michael Moore really highlighted in his work is being able to uh, look at black organizations, even if they were potentially problematic or, you know, may not have been deemed as the most popular or su successful, whatever, whatever, whatever standards you may hold, uh, that you can learn something from, you know, from them. And I think that this is very important. Uh, this is very important, especially as political science moves into a sense of trying to make things generalizable. Because uh, let's just be clear, a broken clock is right twice a day. There is something to be learned from, from everything. And, 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 of course, there was a lot, a lot to be learned um, from the Black Panther Party, but I, I believe, I think one of the things that is necessary is willingness, is a willingness to learn and a willingness to be able to maybe step outside of, of your beliefs and, and what you have already been exposed to, to be able to help, you know, your community achieve the sense of purpose. And as far as what he meant by revolutionary sense of purpose, uh, I, th I think that that is very contextual. I think it, it, you know, it is based upon the person, especially as we are moving into this space of understanding that blackness doesn't exist in a vacuum. There are, you know, black ethnics are different from uh, descendants of those from the African diaspora, all, all of those things. So I think that this revol re revolutionary sense of purpose, uh, it can have its, it can have a, like a, at large meaning, but it's also very individualistic and it also is very dependent upon the time and the context. Uh, and, and I think it is very necessary. I think it's very necessary uh, that we keep in mind this revolutionary sense of purpose and maybe even push to think about what is the, what is the um, black political scientist's role in helping individuals achieve this said purpose. Because as we, you know, you sent us materials and we thank you for all the, all the materials that you gathered for us. Um, and definitely in the, um, in the, oh, I'm sorry guys, in the piece, in the piece that looked at all the founders, we saw that these founders were multifaceted individuals and that they also had a public facing scholarship. Oh, I'm sorry guys, <laughs> I'm gonna pass it off to you. Uh, yeah. I, I, I kind of just going to answer them all at once because they kind of flow together for me. Uh, I guess in a lot of ways, the reason why Black political socialization was so important, and I think 
what Dr. McLemore really hits on with it is this idea of the status quo, uh, which I really appreciate it because that status quo is the norm and the status quo is one for people who look like us is not very inviting. And it was as important then as it is now when you think about the current times that we live in with what we know, the, especially the Republican party in particular emphasizes, they want us to not think about the histories of racial inequality and marginalization. They want us to move past that and act like it didn't happen when we don't just learn those things for sake of learning them, they inform how we navigate the world we exist in today. And they're critical. And the Black, you know, Black socialization is basically that. It's Black ingenuity, Black creativity, uh, navigating a space where it's told that you can't give your teachings and finding ways to do that. And I think there, there, there was some criticism of the Black church, because uh, I think they, they, the example of the black church can preach religiosity, but can the black church, you know, also be the space to spread politics, which at times, you know, I think is a fair criticism, but it makes us think about now, sort of just because we have so many means of black communication and socialization, you know, happening, they're not all right. And they're not all who we should be listening to. And that's a challenge we now face of who are the right voices, who are we giving space to and amplifying as sort of the ones that are largely determining what Black interests are being vocalized and talked about. And that's both a, a, that's a good thing and a bad thing because you want competing interests, but at the same time, you don't want, you know, um, misrepresentation. But Black political socialization was as important then as it is now for many of the exact same reasons because history is repeating itself. Yeah. and. Um... I think for me, when I was thinking about this question, um, I know we talked briefly, us, uh, we as in the panelists, um, that this one kind of, this was a tough question for me to answer a little bit. Cause I'm like, okay, what, what do we mean by that? Like, what is a rev revolutionary sense of purpose, right? Um, and to me, I think that is freedom, right? I think the revol revolutionary sense of freedom is our continual push to freedom, the continual freedom of everyone. And within Dr. McLemore's piece, he talks a lot about um, people who are imprisoned, um, people who are jailed, um, the way in which that we do trials, um, right? Uh, and I think all of those, those captive people also being free, right? Um, and us figuring out ways in which, um, you know, all of us, not just people in the academy, uh, can make sure that our brothers and sisters are free as well, right? Um, and uh, he puts in within this uh, text that we're discussing on page 165 down at the bottom, um, he says, if Black freedom is to become a part of the Black man's existence, Black educators of all political denominations must aspire to the goals of freedom, liberty, and equality, right? Um, so I think just ma maintaining that uh, idea as we go throughout our day of, okay, how is this writing pushing us forward? How, um, how is my teaching in the classroom as a TA or as we have our own, <laughs> our own classes, how is that uh, pushing us forward? How can we instill that not only in our black students and our Latino students, but also our white students. Um, as you see in, in, I guess my corner right here, I'm at the University of Florida um, and I've only had probably five African-American students within my three years, uh, now four years of being a TA here. Um, so it's also trying to put a, a little bit of a battery in their back as well, that the goal is for everyone uh, to, to be free. Um, so I thought, that is sort of uh, where we can begin and sort of maintaining that hope for uh, the future. Yeah, I think another thing that we talked a little bit about that I would love for us to discuss here as well is like, what is the role of oral traditions or like, what is the emphasis of oral traditions in as we think about like this new revolutionary sense of purpose? So I think one of the things that I really enjoyed about Dr. McLemore's piece was that the emphasis on the fact that, you know, Black people are not monolithic, they are different um, and, and varied. And so um, in doing that, there has to be, or from 
his words was that uh, we must rely on or come create some sort of non-traditional communication where we were all kind of on the same page with the same message. Um, and he talked about oral traditions in accomplishing that goal of creating and establishing this sense of non-traditional communication. Uh, I think you have more to add about that, Jazz. Yeah, so thinking of thinking about the importance of oral tradition, um, and I'm and I'm and and so I'm gonna juxtapose this with some with something that he also said about the tradition traditional means of communication. So uh Dr. McElmore said that black people shouldn't rely on the traditional means of communication, radio, television, and white press. We must develop our own develop our own channels of communication. And yet here I don't think that Dr. McElmore was uh, saying that these things didn't exist, but was uh, but was pushing the reader to say like, hey, you know, this is where you need to be paying attention. And 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 out and he also discusses um, person to person contact as a means of socialization for Black folks. And so that gets into the importance of oral tradition. And I think that Dr. McLemore was really trying to uh, push forward the importance of this because that is some that is a way in which. Black people have always learned, and it is a way. It is a way that sometimes is not appreciated by the academy. Um, but I study Black political knowledge, um, and and I'm re very interested in pl uh, political socialization and how Black people know what they know. And part of this knowing is oral tradition. I opened my dissertation and we're talking about the Green Book Motorist Guide. And, and before the Green Book Motorist Guide was a thing, this was oral tradition. It was, hey, you can't stop here. Hey don't drive through here. Um, if you're going to stop, you better not do it at nightfall. And these were things that kept Black people safe. And these are also the things that will, you will not see in traditional means of communication. So I think that this thing of oral tradition is something that is longstanding, that has gone, that, you know, go, that transcends now and has gone back to I insisted we're even here. Like this was a thing that's always been here that we cannot forget and that we must rely on in order to make sure that we can have a sense or, or understand what revolutionary sense of purpose may have been and how it is going to transform for us today. We and and when we were talking kind of earlier, I was I was telling you guys we can't, you know, we can't discredit the uh, ways of our, you know, those who came before us. And I think that. In honoring that and, and really thinking about oral tradition and listening to our elders, we will be able to have a better grasp on what this revolutionary sense of purpose looks like for us. And I really don't think that we can do it without them. I also think just really from this is complete researcher only perspective on it, I guess, the importance of the oral tradition is captured in the fact that what Macklemore was really criticizing was this idea of predispositions. Uh, so we're thinking American voter, we're thinking Zoller and stuff like that. This idea of that is just what you know, but it's an ongoing process. It's something you're continually taught and learned and that's how it happens. And oral tradition really emphasizes that there. And that's really what black socialization in general is doing. Of uh, You aren't just socialized once in your life as a black person. It's something we experience every day. It's something I experienced again, leaving undergrad and becoming a member of NCOPES and you get socialized into this new space for black people there. So it's an ongoing process. And that's why I really appreciated what Macklemore did as someone, you know, doing socialization work. It was sort of like, it was comforting knowing that we are, <laughs> we're already moving in that direction there. And I think that's the direction really research wise we are headed. Uh, I think we really did start with the psychological connectedness perspective. That's how we know, yes, we have linked fate and it's stuff like that. But we've also come to understand now linked fate itself is a dependent variable. Linked fate itself fluctuates. It can change from person to person and over time. And a lot of that is going to do with sort of what you're taught and you're being you know, taught about the importance of community. You're being taught about the importance of being connected with one another. You aren't just born with that. And we have systemic factors that we just, you know, naturally react to, but there are certain things that we're just, we learn from our parents, from our aunts, our uncles, our friends, of this is how we do things. And I think we slowly move back that way. So we're thinking about counter publics. Uh, we really think about what staff as Democrats <laughs> is really, you know, that's really, that's really pushing us in that direction there. And really now the question is sort of, 
we have so many different agents of that socialization. We don't just have one. And it's sort of us thinking about which ones matter more, how they work in concert, but moving away from psychological to sociological, is that, is that the right word? I can't say words really, but it's like moving away from, moving to sociology perspective, you know, with thinking about black politics, I think that gives us a better chance to really emphasize the importance of community for black people. And it's, you know, as we're thinking about not just having race as a control variable anymore, but what race really entails for different groups, that would allow us to have certain distinctions because what happened with Link Fate, it got used to then all of a sudden, you know, incorrectly applied to Latinos and Asian Americans. Not they don't have their own, you know, cultural differences, you know, and ways that they respond to living in white America. But when we incorrectly apply concepts because we aren't basing it really in that group's experience anymore. That's why. And I think a sociology approach for us is important for that reason, because it'll allow us to not just say and gatekeep a concept, but it'll challenge us to say sort of why. What, why, why is you know, uh, the rate of station important for Black people? Is it important for Asian Americans and so forth there? And it really allows us to really make, um, <laughs> It allows us to make Black people the focus and not have to deal with the questions we get in a, in a conference of why didn't you ask white people the same question there? Because it doesn't matter for them. They're not the focus here. And I'm really excited for us moving that direction. Also, um, just to add on, um, when we're thinking about these uh, non-traditional means of communications, um, you know, at the time, Dr. McLemore couldn't probably even imagine uh, something like Black Twitter, right? Um, in the shade room and all these other places, whether good or bad, that Black people are adding to this conversation, uh, that they're building these communications, they're building these channels to each other, right? Uh, to make things like uh, the Black Trans March that happened in Brooklyn, that happened squarely because of, um, of Twitter, right? And being able to connect with these people in these places and these things and ideas. Um, and it allows us to see that uh, we're, we, as in Black people, are doing something special, uh, right? That there even can be called a Black Twitter uh, that's allowing us to build on these ideas and traditions. Um, and I know that's not directly oral tradition, uh, but it's sort of that same idea and processes, right? Um, and also spaces like this, where we are talking about Dr. Scott's work. And earlier today, we were out. Uh, I, I was able to sit in uh, the Dr. Jewel Prestige um, uh, panel, where you know I, you know, I'm a recent member, right? Uh, so I've never got to hear Dr. Prestige speak, um, but. Dr. Penderhughes allowed us to just hear her voice um, and hear how she was bringing things in and up. And uh, I, it was so powerful just to know about her and her work. And it's like, okay, well, how can I leave that sort of lasting impression while I'm here, right? Um, so those sort of things um, and these sort of spaces uh, can help build that gap um, and hopefully connect us to a, a larger, uh, black future. I wanted to kind of expound upon something that MJ said as far as us, um, as far as concepts being misused. And I think that if if we were, if we, you know, as we continue, because black black politics guys have, you know, very much so prioritized world tradition. But as we continue to prioritize world tradition in uh, in making our concepts. And, 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 and even operationalizing, potentially operationalizing our concepts, this will prevent, uh, so there's there's a scholar in, he's a comparative scholar, and this is something that I, I'm a conceptual person that I try and impart in my students and almost everybody I come in contact with. Uh, Americans do not think about conceptual stretching and conceptual traveling. And essentially what this is is, are you stretching a concept into a place that is not, are you expanding this concept so broadly and so that it loses its original meaning? Also with conceptual traveling, if you take this concept and put it in another context, is it still appropriate? And that's not something necessarily that happens in, in the work of Americanists. But if we, if we bake in oral tradition, and this is a part of how we are building our concepts, then if someone wants to use our concept, they're going to have, if you skip that step, 
you've had a miss you it's a it's i don't want to call it a mistake but it is going to be a misstep and it is going to show potentially that this concept is not going to travel well to your group this concept is not should not be stretched to this extent either because your group does not have the same experience that is outlined in this oral tradition so i do think that oral tradition really could um, help clear up some of the issues that we have in political science and, and oral tradition specifically in other quant uh, qualitative methods can help clear up some of these issues that we have when it comes to you know conceptualization and even operationalization of measures so revolutionary sense of purpose uh is freedom it comes from oral exchange and oral tradition um i love that appreciate you guys response one of the things that i think uh, when we were kind of talking about what we would discuss here today, that we all admired so much about both scholars uh, is their ability to be involved in so many things that transcended the boundary of any academic institution. And so whether that was their scholarship, uh, whether that was their activism, whether that was their institution building, Dr. McLemore himself uh, was uh, founded the political science department at my alma mater, as well as Jasmine's uh, Jackson State, uh, the political science department there, and also the Fannie Lou Hamer uh, Center, where I actually had the opportunity to work um, and kind of work with the community from that particular center and understanding the importance of that particular center and the opportunities that it provide to the community. And so in thinking about, you know, the ways in which we are reassessing Black politics and reassessing these strategies for Black liberation, how important is it for us to kind of follow in their footsteps of taking some of these things that we learn, the scholarship that we learn here in these academic spaces and applying them to some spaces within the community? I think it's, I think it's very important. I, I, you know, I, I think that, um, I think that as a as a black political scientist, uh, you should want your work to be able to be shared with uh, our our community. Um, and I, I can't tell you know everybody's work is so different. I can't tell you how to how to essentially apply your work to the community. I know how it relates to. I know what I want to do with my work and and the way I want to share it. Um, but I think it's good for us to know that. Uh, political scientists that came before us had this call to action and that if we can we should um you know this ivory tower we even if some people may say we're still on the outside of it some people may say we're in it but it was never meant for us it was never meant for us to be here and in order for us to be able to do work that is truly representative of our communities we have to make sure that they can understand our work and and i i I tell folks, you know, when I do my focus groups with them, I'm going to let them read the focus group chapter. And if they hate it, then I got to go back to the drawing board because what I do, I don't want to make the same mistakes as some of the mainstream political scientists because I know I am trying to truly understand what my community knows about politics. So my experience is not the sole Black experience. And the only way I'm going to get that is by engaging with my community. So I, I personally am going to keep doing that. And I, I, I think everybody should. And But just being completely honest, and we talked about this earlier, public facing scholarship and being a scholar, activist, entrepreneur don't always get you tenure. You know, it, it doesn't. We have to work within the guidelines of, of academia, but it can be done. It can be done. We have great examples of how it was done. I'm not saying that those who came before us or even some of the uh, Black political scientists we know now haven't had their struggles, but they at least have a blueprint for us to follow. They have wisdom that they can pass down to us through oral tradition. And I think we should listen to it so that we can find that balance of you know being able to exist within or outside of the ivory tower and also in our communities. Yeah, I, I made the joke earlier today when we were talking about, you know, how we're all the personal Wikipedia pages for our families as political scientists. Uh, and like, yes, that 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 is kind of a, a joking role, but it's also one of sort of, they're coming to us because they're trusting us. And 
we have, I, I take it seriously. When my parents and my aunts and uncles, they text me about something random happening in China or anywhere else in the world, I actually, you know, take the time. I want to make sure that I'm giving them the right information because they're trusting me with it there. And the reason I realized my dad even told me, he was like, I could Google it, but like, I like it when you tell it to me and stuff like that, which is other reasons because the geek is crazy. But it's also reflective of the fact that it's like, back to that oral tradition and finding ways to communicate information in informative ways to people is imperative, but it's also important in our work. You know, if we're doing work studying black people, that's who our audience should be. I could care less how much my work resonates with white people. Like just no, no offense about it. It's, it's really, that's not who I'm talking to. They're not gonna get it. Cause the things I'm talking about, the things that I'm, that's inspiring my work, it's what I've lived, it's what I've experienced there. And if you ain't lived that or lived something like that, it ain't for you, that's it. Um, so, and, it's, and that's what makes it you know, easy. That's what makes it fun. That's what motivates us to do our work there. So it's, if our experiences motivated us to get into this, why are we departing from that? Like stay with that and cultivate that and grow that and make that bigger and better. Cause that's like, you know, that's what makes it fun. That's also what transcends the boundary because that transcending boundaries also includes, like Jasmine said, the public facing work. So the folks, some of them even on here, like, you know, doing that public facing work and doing, you know, things that aren't exactly gonna get them tenure. I do see that, like, you know, as a young, you know, scholar, I see that and I appreciate it because things that I want to do and you're forging a path that hopefully we can normalize that counting towards tenure one day. And if it doesn't, oh, well, I'm still doing it because that work matters and we appreciate it. But you're also like, the, they're the ones who make it safe and inviting for us. For a lot of us, we're at schools where we don't have a black politics program. Most of them have RAP programs and that transcending boundaries includes supporting us and having the ghost mentors. I got one, I'm sure most of us have had one or have one still now. And like that transcending boundaries counts for all that there. It's doing the stuff, the unseen work, the work that doesn't count for you when you say that you're a professor of political scientist, but you're a member of this community. And being a community member includes just us, you know, in this conference, but then also the ones who aren't studying political science, but that we're talking about and studying with. And all that matters and like, getting that connection back and not forgetting that the stuff we're studying and the stuff we live, I think helps. Yeah, and uh, just to add two more cents, because I mean, y'all really covered it already. Um, I just wanted to add that, you know, we really are at war with misinformation right now, right? Within our community. Um, we saw that with vaccines, we see that with uh, election stuff, and it is really important for us as scholars, right, uh, to say it in a way that they understand it. Um, and I was thinking about this with some friends of, okay, how did this person start going that way? Well, the opposite side is putting it in the simplest terms possible. If we're saying stuff that's too complicated to be understood, of course, they're going to say, we're not making sense. I would want to go to the place where, okay, that one plus one might equal three, but it makes sense that it equals three, right? So making sure that we're saying things in ways that um, our family members can understand, right? I always think about that. How can I write this in a way that my grandma would be able to understand? How can I write this in a way that my dad would be under able to understand? Because um, that, I think, is what is going to help move Black politics, right? And help us when we do go to the public eye, right? When we're you know, you know, hopefully as we uh, expand in our careers, when we are on television, uh, given those exchanges, that we're saying stuff that hits, that makes sense, um, and that everyone really understands. Um, so like I said, I didn't have much to add because y'all really covered all that. Yeah, and that's what I, I really enjoyed about reading Dr. Elsie Scott's paper, uh, both of her papers, um, and even her blog posts. It's like reading those entries was like reading the newspaper and being informed about the issues that were happening at that time in a clear way to be able to make connections to how those things apply today. Um, and even just I, from reading her paper and even her blog post, I looked up the Kerner Commission and I went back to her work <laughs> to kind of really fully understand the things that they were reporting. 
And so I think uh, Dr. Wendy Smooth left a comment here in this comment section that I think would be great for us to leave this particular um, question off on, which is, which she stated, increasingly public facing work or community engaged scholarship is being recognized. It brings shine on your university. Key is that you promote your scholarship as connected to your institution. And I thought it was important uh, to read that because as we are reimagining, rethinking these ways of being able to engage in these ways, I thought that was really great advice and we appreciate your comment, Dr. Smoothie. Um, so the last question, and then we will open it up for questions or comments from the audience, um, was a question I think is really appropriate given the, given the, uh, the purpose and the, given the, 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 our conference theme, theme was the word I could not remember. Given our conference theme, I thought this would be an appropriate question, but also because a lot of, you know, the work that we read, we talked just already in depth in, in our earlier conversation about how all of that stuff is important as we think about where we are today. And the video that we watched at the beginning of uh, this panel kind of reinforced that as well. So the final question for you guys is thinking about the work um, and the profiles that we've read on both Dr. Elsie Scott and Dr. Uh, McLemore, what is the future for Black people globally? And how does the work of both scholars help in our present understanding? What can, and then, you know, the other part is what can we learn from their work as we adapt the vision we have for Black futures? Yeah, so when we, when we talked to, when we, when you presented us with this question, we kind of talk through, and, and I'm not going to talk about all of it because I know everybody else has to talk, has to say something, but I, I really, I really enjoyed the fact that both of these scholars work really, um, it, it checks us, like, the, like reading the work of past political scientists, it checks us. And I, I made the comment earlier that this work also ensures that we're not, as we say, losing recipes. It makes sure that we're not losing recipes and make sure that we understand that there are folks who look like us who have already had these thoughts and we should be engaging uh, with them in conversation and also making sure that we are not being stagnant and moving this conversation forward for the next uh, generation of Black political scientists, Black scholars in, in other uh, arenas, history, sociology. And if we continue to do that, I believe our future is absolutely bright. Um, and what we can what we can learn from, our, from their work is that there is value in our ideas. Um, and as Michael said earlier, you know, a lot of us, some of us, when we, you know, we might have went to HBCU for undergrad, but as we have entered our PhD programs, we're in predominantly white institutions. And I, I told one of my community members, I said, I'm just going to be honest with you, grad school don't prepare you to be a black political scientist. It don't. But this, this, this type of work that the founders of NCOPES have been doing, it does. It's the things that, you know, some of these papers that you gave us, I will probably try to read once a month because I, you know, we really need to know that our ideas matter and that we, it's, it's worth furthering because there are other folks who are thinking about these things. Um, so I think there's a lot to, a lot to learn, a lot to still say. And if we're able to, if, and I, I really think that if we're able to continue these conversations, we could really get some things done for our, our communities. Yeah, I think the thing for me and like, you know, thinking about the direction of us as scholars moving forward, like the proud thing is that we have our own canon now. Like we have pieces like this that I can, I can now refer back to and not have to fight tooth and nail with somebody about, because I have brilliant scholars before me who will set the stage and have already explained what was wrong with political socialization and why black political socialization is the only thing here. And like, that's so encouraging to think about because it saves me a lot of time and effort. And actually by working in reverse and going back and finding these kind of pieces, it's also like, you know, nice affirmation of good, I'm in conversation with the right people. But it's also like something for us to think about is that politics citation. Because that piece from Dr. Blacklemore, as insightful as it was, it has two citations. And that's the kind of thing we're talking about what becomes, you know, 
the standard, what becomes sort of like, oh, you incite that piece? Like, you can't talk about partisanship and not cite Campbell 1960, whatever the full thing is there. And it's like, after I finished my comprehensive exam, it's like, I'm tired of some of y'all. I'm tired of reciting the same people, talking about the same five books from all from Michigan. It's like, there's more out there. And it's like, having founders of NCOPE, you know, important scholars like this, you know, do work that speaks to our experiences is great for us because it allows us to develop our own, you didn't cite this, you didn't cite that, and not have to deal with them. And that's exciting and encouraging, but it's important that we have things like this to bring it back and remind us that these pieces are out there because they were right then and they were right now. Yeah, um, and I think another avenue uh, that I was thinking about was the sort of uh, legacy that they put in place before they even got to grad school, the work that they were doing in undergraduate, um, if there are undergrads on the call, you know, that they're, they were still working, right? Uh, they were doing their classes and they were starting these organizations and they were in their community. Um, and as an undergrad, I was trying to do the same thing. Luckily, I got the chance to come to INCOPES while I was in undergrad, thanks to Dr. Seku Franklin, who's I think is on the call right now. Um, and I was a part of BSU and I was trying to make sure that we had safe spaces on campus. Um, and I hate to say that it's definitely something I sort of um, waned away from while I was in undergraduate uh, or now that I'm in grad school because I've just felt busy, you know what I'm saying? But there's something that after reading this, it's like, okay, I really need to get back to doing what I wanted to do, right? Like I love being in the community. I love serving. And that is another avenue, right? I can't just be uh, within Anderson Hall. I need to be out in the community, right? Like I live on Fifth Street. I live in the community uh, because I wanted to be around Black people in Gainesville. Uh, so I need to, for me personally, after reading this, it's like, okay, I need to get back to them. I need to get back to the community, right? Comps are over get back into the community. Um, uh, so I think uh, sort of that just maintenance um, and also uh, thinking about maintaining hope uh, and just continuing that fight, I guess, in both public and private life um, and trying to have these conversations uh, outside of the academic journals too, right? Um, sort of the other side of uh, what Michael is saying. Um, so yeah. I know we got to start question and answer. Yes. Uh, Cassie, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to say that everything that we've said, like everything that we've said in this question and a lot of conversation we had, I think is signaling that we are potentially going in the right direction because when you read the Black Public Sphere Collective, there's a piece in there that talks about uh, aspects of that are particular to the Black Public Sphere. And one of those things is critical memory. And so critical memory is a judgmental critical evaluation of the past that does not seem that long from the present. And critical memory is only, it, it only can happen if it's through the mem the remembering of the collective. And so the piece that you had, the 2020 piece you had us read uh, by some of the current NCOPES members and the, I think it was the, also a 2020 or 2022 piece by Ashley Daniels you had us read about the women presidents of NCOPES. Those are, like, in, those are monumental things that are pushing us towards this critical memory. And, and we now, I, I, just, I just think that we're going in the right direction given that what we're talking about right now really aligns with some of the work of previous scholars. Thank you guys for sharing your thoughts and thanks for all of you guys for just engaging with us. Uh, before we start our Q and A, I do want to give a thank you and then also just a plug on uh, this, uh, the papers that we used to prepare, uh, Madam President by Ashley Daniels. She talks about the life histories of all of the Black women uh, in Coast presidents. And then uh, Sherry Wallace, uh, Dr. Sherry Wallace, Dr. Wendy Smooth, Dr. Tasha Philpot, and quite a few other authors also published some pieces chronicle uh, discussing uh, the founders of Encodes and some of the more senior members who have done so, mo so, so much work uh, to push this organization forward. And so I appreciate you guys for sharing those papers with us as we prepare for this. And I encourage all of you guys who are in the audience to read more 
uh, to read these papers just to learn more about uh, where our organization began and the work that a lot of these awesome scholars have done uh, to bring us to this point. So as we move to Q&A, we have two questions here. Uh, the first one is from Dara Gaines. The question is, is one element of this new sort of communication, the emphasis we put on our oral tradition or what all discuss or what you all discuss as our duty to our communities? That's the new way, that's the question. I don't know if this was a question or a comment. I think this may have been a comment. Um, do any of you guys want to address that? It's in the chat. I, can I saw it too. I saw it too and thought it was potentially just a comment. I think, um, yeah. So then we have another quick question we can answer here um, from, it just says ENCODE's presenter. Are any of you Pi Sigma Alpha members? And if so, have you leveraged your membership in Pi Sigma Alpha to support your graduate studies? I have, I participated uh, as a facilitator and a discussant for uh, several uh, PSA uh, conferences for the under, undergrad students. Um, and it, it, I definitely uh, was able to leverage my previous involvement with PSA as an undergrad. Uh, shout out to Dr. Ori for introducing us to that space um, to support my study. So yes, I've, I've been involved with that. I have as well. Uh, I, the exact same thing that Kesia said. I serve as a uh, discussant slash facilitator of panels for the Pi Sigma Alpha undergrad um, research conference. And uh, yeah, they it, it, it's a good way to stay plugged in and to you know make sure that we are uh, helping the next generation of political scientists. Make sure that they are um, getting some of this wisdom that we've got from our mentors and advisors. And then we have another question from Jessica Lynn Stewart. She asks, what are your thoughts on a generational divide within the black community regarding political issues? Does it exist? If so, why? What do older generations not understand about how young black people see politics? How do younger generations view older black responses to political issues? I can repeat that for you guys if you would like me to. Are you saying repeated, Kelly? I see your hand. No, sorry. We, uh, I think we can see. Okay, perfect. Okay. Jump in however you see fit. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I think it's a mix of both. Uh, I think part of it is, A, if you take seriously, you know, the heterogeneity of Black public opinion and just the fact that we're not a monolith, like we always have these different views. Uh, I think that, we have moved towards a generation that's empowered people to take on some of those, you know, conflicting views sometimes. And I think part of the generational divide actually comes like from that lack of oral history at certain points. Uh, I think one of my biggest annoyances on Twitter is whenever I see someone use that hashtag, we are not our ancestors. It's, it's one of my biggest pet peeves in, my, in the entire world because is it implying and suggesting that they were soft, weak or whatever there. And it's almost like, if you learn some of the stories they was up to, it's like, no, you're right. You're not them because they was built different. Like they were they were doing things that I can't even imagine doing, you know, fighting. And it's like, we we forget that sometimes. And I think it's almost like a, a weird competition we then develop of sort of like our perceptions of what previous generations were doing and our understandings of that. And part of it, I think, is, you know, going back to what's being taught in schools of where we're framing history in convenient ways that kind of, you know, frames the truth in a way that suggests that they weren't doing something or it obscures the efforts and fights being made there. And it's almost like there's a generation of buy that's being created, not entirely by, you know, members of the Black community itself, but those outside aids to socialization so, you know, that goes back to socialization goes both ways for Black people, and it's important to have both there. It's like, it's happening, but not by their own agency. And I think what MJ just said is that I think this is very important because I don't, I, as you said, there, this generational divide may not actually potentially be there. This is not something that I study, but uh, something that I had to kind of visit for my dissertation. And there's a piece by Dr. Larry Sim, Claire Chapman, and some other NCOPES uh, scholars. 
I want to say it's in the, uh, the Incopes Journal about generational differences regarding Black Lives Matter protests. And they actually found that there were no, there were like, that there wasn't this divide between the generations as much as we would have thought. And, and I remember reading the piece and thinking, wow, because we always, you know, kind of heard like, why can't you protest peacefully? We protested peacefully. So I'm not necessarily, I, I, I agree with MJ that this, this divide might not be exactly what we think it is. And it, it may be outside forces or the scholarship of folks outside of our community that is pu pushing us to maybe think that this divide is there on especially issues that are very important to us where so it, it, that might not be the case. Yeah, um, right. I'll just yield my time over to Casey. I know we're running late. Yes, we are running a little short on time. So we will, there is another question here about, um, did we announce some of the support that the PSA provided for graduate students? We did not, um, but that is something that I will talk more with you about. Um, we're running a little short on time here. So I will pass it over to um, the leaders of APSA for their remarks. Uh, but before I do, I would just like to thank everybody for coming out. Thanks for all of your support in the comments, uh, read it and kind of engaged with it as we were going. And also thanks to the awesome panelists for being here, for offering your remarks. Um, and this concludes the Founder Symposium. I see Dr. Elsie Scott on stage. so. We appreciate you being here as well um, and hope you enjoyed the conversation. We'll pass it over to APSA. Thank you guys. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for um, joining us and for allowing uh, APSA to have space on this really important panel. I am just very moved and impressed and, um, and inspired by the students that we just heard from. And I'm happy to say that a number of them are actually alumni of the APSA Diversity Fellowship Program, as well as the APSA Ralph Bunch Summer Institute, both of which are programs that former president of ENCOPES, Dr. Joel Prestige, helped to found and organize um, as a way to recruit uh, and advance the careers of African-Americans within the field of political science. So it's so excited. I, I'm so excited to have been able to hear your wonderful thoughts. And I can say that the future of political science is bright. And I look forward to hearing more about you all and reading all of the scholarship that you will and that you already have produced. Uh, so at, at this time, I would like to thank uh, President Tiffany Willoughby Harrard and also Vice President uh, Emmett Riley, as well as Executive Director of NCOPES, Kathy Stromiel Golden, for affording this opportunity for the American Political Science Association president to have remarks on the panel. And um, without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Johnny Shiyama. Dr. Ishiyama is the current president of the American Political Science Association. Dr. Ishiyama is the University Distinguished Research Professor of Political Science and the Piper Professor of Texas at the University of North Texas. He has uh, convened a task force for the American Political Science Association that is entitled Rethinking Political Science Education. Welcome, John. Uh, thank you, Kim. I'm going to share my screen. I'll try to be very quick. I'm a degenerate presenter, so I have a PowerPoint, of course. Uh, let me put that up there if you bear with me for a moment. Uh, yes, I think that's it. And let's put here. And what happened to, oh, yes, here we go. Right, let me change this, please. Can you all see that screen by chance? Yeah, great. Yes, Excellent. we can see it. Okay. Um, let, let me think, let me start by saying a few things about the panel that just concluded. I found it absolutely fascinating. It is a tremendous and bad, very hard act for me to follow. In fact, if I were able to cede my time to the panel, I would be glad to cede that time. 
I think it was quite insightful. I, I have to admit, uh, I was pleasantly, I was very pleasant to hear Jasmine's reference to conceptual stretching. I mean, you know, that, that is the, that's a concept that I grew up with because frankly, I'll, truth be told, I'm a comparativist, so it was very nice to hear. Also, Jasmine's point about making things understandable to my mom, I can really understand. She just turned 94 yesterday and she's still very much interested in politics. So I have to explain things to her about the world. And then, you know, um, but then she she's also thinks that I wear a pointy square hat in my classroom with the black suit when I teach. That's So my mom is not really connected to the world of academia, but, you know, that's part of what I need to do is to explain it to my mom, to make it simple for my mom, who's 94 years old, to understand. I think that's what we need to tell our students, too. We have knowledge we have to communicate, and we have to put it in terms they understand. So I could not agree more than uh, that po with that point. Uh, finally, I it would be, uh, I'm, I'm pretty parochial, too, so Keisha's uh, represents Michigan State very well. And I am a graduate of Michigan State's program and go green. And I hope they beat Wisconsin today because they're in the tournament. Okay, uh, I've wasted enough time. Also, I would also like to thank the NCOPE's leadership uh, for allowing me to speak with you a few days, uh, a few for a few moments. And let me turn to that. I'll try to keep it very short because I know time is short, but I'd like to introduce my uh, task force called Rethinking Political Science Education. And essentially, it sort of outlines what my plans are for the coming year. You know, our discipline faces many challenges. Most immediately, the past two years have witnessed social unrest and a global pandemic that has wreaked havoc across the globe. Times like these cause us to rethink most everything about our discipline, how we run our conferences, how we interact as colleagues, how we influence policymakers, how we publish and make our research consumable to a broader public, not just each other. And for me, what is most important, how we teach. In many ways, the teaching of political science is more important now than ever before, not least because we teach skills that produce leaders. Our students know, or they should know how to diagnose and analyze a problem, to come up with plans based on evidence to solve those problems, to mobilize support for their initiatives and actions, and to use ethical insight to guide the use of power to achieve desired ends. These skills are now needed more at all levels of society, not just in government, but also in the private sector, the nonprofit sector, in civil society, and internationally. Thus, rethink the, the, the teaching of political science at the undergraduate and graduate levels is needed now more than ever and especially how we structure and organize our educational programs. Now what's coming uh, in, the com in this year under my presidency are two things, they're interrelated. First of all, the Montreal APSA conference, which will be in September, 2022, is entitled Towards a Post-Pandemic Political Science. The co-chairs of my conference, which includes somebody who's been mentioned today is Cherie Wallace and uh, my good friend, Cherie Wallace and my good friend, Pei Lien. Uh, they're doing a really fantastic job in putting together a conference, and especially, I, you know, I would encourage all of you to check out the program. It, it's really fantastic. Uh, the pandemic has been challenging, but it also offers opportunities for us to make fundamental changes in what we do as a discipline, ranging from publishing to research to what we do in design of conferences and how we teach. The second initiative is my task force, which I think of more as the beginning rather than the end and it's entitled Rethinking Political Science Education. Why we need to think, rethink political science education? Well, we face a number of challenges. Student enrollments in political science have declined and the pattern of enrollments have changed. The demographic characteristics of undergraduate students have changed. There are greater demands for employable skills, not only from students, but from their parents, as well as other stakeholders. There is an increasing need for civic education and civic engagement as demonstrated by the political crises of the past year. Our students are not prepared to be engaged citizens in a democracy, and we may not be producing the PhDs who can teach them how to be engaged citizens in a democracy. Now, there have been efforts, efforts by APSA to address some of these challenges. There are important initiatives on civic engagement launched by Roger Smith on promoting equity and social justice in our discipline, including 
fair citation practices uh, introduced by Paula McLean and to explore alternative career paths outside of academia introduced by Jan Buck Steffensmeyer. There, however, has not been a major APSA report issued on the structure of the undergraduate major, for example, since the Walkie Report of 1991. What is needed is a new Walkie Report that includes voices and perspectives that were left out of that report. That the commission that had been uh, convened to write that report were largely made up of representatives of R1 schools and elite liberal arts colleges. And certainly a lot of things have changed since 1991. So what do we envision the task force doing? I see the task force building and expanding upon the efforts of the working group, which has been addressing the need, the question of rethinking the undergraduate major. Uh, uh, some of us uh, in the past three years have been working on rethinking how we might uh, structure the undergraduate major to rethink some principles that might lay out the basis for a new walkie report. However, the scope of my task force will be broader and more ambitious than the work laid out by this working group on the on undergraduate education. The task force will work on rethinking political science education at all levels, from education at K through 12 level, which we as a discipline have largely abandoned over the course of the last 30 years, to undergraduate political science majors, to PhDs. How are these levels interconnected? We need to address how K through 12 students, for example, are prepared because many are attaining college level credit via AP, dual credit, and other arrangements. We've had very little impact on, on how these things are settled, how these things are set up, how these programs are set up in the K through 12 level. How do community college programs intersect with four year institutions since a growing number of our students transfer from two to four year institutions? We need to reassess and reaffirm the value of a political science degree, especially as undergraduate and graduate political science scholars face a changing and uncertain job market. Uh, in many ways, this involves assessment to show the world that our, that our students, I'm sorry, our students are learning. This task force will identify critical skills and knowledge that students should know. So undergraduates learn these things and graduate students can learn how to teach these things. We need to rethink what political science means and focus on how we can structure our programs to realize essential learning goals. A key part of this project is promoting a discipline-wide discussion of what it is we believe that is critical for a political science student to know in terms of knowledge and skills not only to provide them skills that are usable, but prepare them to be an engaged citizen in a democracy. Students need to learn about tolerance and diversity and be exposed to many points of view, not to label the ones they don't agree with as traitorous and the enemy. They need to understand that our country has made mistakes and there has been much injustice, but that we are also labeled to learn from those mistakes and correct them not to ignore these mistakes to make some feel better about themselves. Critical thinking means to question your own assumptions and beliefs, and that cannot be done if you ignore the past. Students should not be spoon fed a version of their history where nothing went wrong and everything was heroic. That is not a history for a democracy, but a history autocracies try to create. In the end, I expect a set of concrete recommendations upon which we can build an action plan to provide educators with guidance on how to structure their programs and to meet the challenges we currently face. In short, the work of this task force will be a beginning, not an end. We are in my view, however, at a transformative moment as the past APSA president, Jan Bach Steffens Meyer uh, pointed out in her address in Seattle, we must prepare our students for these challenges, for the golden age of political science, and to better prepare our students in citizenry for this new age. Uh, actually, Jan had said the golden age of social science, but I took this to mean political science. In many ways, I see my presidency as a direct continuation of the paths laid out by my predecessors, Professors Bach Steffensmeyer, Paula McLean, 
and Roger Smith. We must prepare our students at all levels for this new age and to change the trajectory of our democracy in this country and in the world. And political science as a discipline, I believe, is up to that challenge. And I look very much forward to working with all of you. Uh, thank you for tolerating my comments today, and thank you very much for having me. I hope I didn't go over too much or too much time. Thank you very much, John. Uh, we're just looking to see if there are any questions in the audience. Um, I do see one question, let's see. I believe from Jasmine, Jasmine Jackson. Yes, I see that in the, in the uh, uh, chat. Yes. Um, you know, the, the real, this is, a, this is an interesting challenge because I think there's been considerable discussion about the undergraduate major, how it's structured. Uh, there has been considerable discussion about how graduate programs are discuss, uh, structured. Uh, K through 12 is very difficult for us to penetrate now because we abandon the field. Uh, in fact, we have very little to do with K through 12 curriculum. We have very little to do with the structuring of K through 12 curriculum. I think part of the task force, or at least this committee within the task force is to uh, write about how we might develop strategies by which we can help structure or influence the design of K through 12 curriculum. So I, I can't say that I can promise you that we can do anything in the near future. It has to be, we have to first of all, address the fact that we've ignored it for 30 years. You know, I use, uh, I hate to, my, my, my daughters, I use them as an example. And they always say, oh, Dad, you're talking about us again. But you know, uh, frankly, my daughters, they took a uh, dual credit in high school in American government. And frankly, they learned absolutely nothing because it was taught by the high school football coach. Nothing against high school football, but that high school football coach told them that the constitution was written by God. Uh, I, 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 and they got college credit for that. Uh, I, I am flabbergasted by that, but in, in part, it's partially our fault because in our rush to do other things, we ignored uh, one of the core uh, goals of the American Political Science Association, and that was to develop a democratic citizenry by paying attention to civic education, which we've abandoned. Now, the second part about, you know, this effort to get rid of critical race theory, you know, uh, I, I'm from Texas, uh, our itty, well, our, uh, our, our lieutenant governor, who I won't name his name, but has really pushed uh, sort of deny the attempt to get rid of tenure. His whole purpose for getting rid of tenure is so that he can eliminate people who are teaching critical race theory. Uh, uh, the, ban, uh, the, ban, the, uh, the ban on critical race theory at K through 12, um, I think we need to fight back on that in particular because what it means is that, oh, we have to eliminate everything in the curriculum that causes essentially white people to be feel, feel bad about themselves. That's not how you develop critical thinking. If everything is hunky-dory and you never question your assumptions, then what kind of students are we producing? So I can't, unfortunately, Jasmine, I can't give you a concrete plan as how we're going to address this, but I think we can start by having a discipline-wide conversation about how we get back into the K through 12 arena. At least we can start now. We need to start now. That's probably the most important thing we could do in readdressing or re addressing rethinking political science education. Uh, okay. Are there other questions? I hope that answers your question, Jennifer. Thank you, John. I do believe we have a question from Professor Jasmine Yarish. Yes, thank you so much, um, President Ishiyama, for being here and for, or for um, sharing this task force with us. Um, I'm a faculty member at an HBCU that does a lot of work on dual enrollment. So I was wondering if you could let me know about the task force breakdown. How many HBCU faculty have you recruited for this task force? Because I think there are a lot of faculty at HBCUs that would be, would be able to give good insightful information because they have been doing more work, a lot of work in the K through 12 mm -hmm. um, se sector. Right. I actually can't answer that because we're not finished recruiting. Uh, we're currently discussing the composition of the task force. Uh, we're finishing up with the structure. I, I can share with you that the structure of the task force, uh, and I, I have to say, I, I am inspired by my predecessor, um, uh, Paula McClain, because she's always very organized. So I like the idea of having sort of subcommittees and 
what I call tracks. There are three basic tracks in the task force on graduate education, undergraduate education, and K through 12. Uh, I have to say that um, we are moving forward on undergraduate and graduate uh, education because they, they, they tend to be, um, we've addressed those more uh, uh, concretely. Uh, uh, the um, K through 12 track is wide open. I mean, we're still trying to identify people who can work those areas. And I, I'm, I'm sure that uh, if you want, you could sort of provide me some insights as to who we might recruit uh, from HBCUs, because I think that is critical. Um, you know, I, I know less about uh, that. And I'm less, and I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm probably like every, a lot of other my colleagues, I, I haven't paid much attention to it until, until recently. And I think it's critical. Um, so I can't tell you how many HBCUs are, uh, uh, currently on the task force, there are two uh, in the undergraduate and graduate education uh, task forces, but I haven't filled out my K through 12 yet. So there are openings. Thank you, John. Um, and it looks like we probably have time for two more questions. I see one question here from um, Tiffany Willoughby Harrard. It says, has the APSA endorsed the ethnic studies in K through 12 movement across the country? I, I No, I don't think there has been a statement. Uh, so if, if there's a statement of endorsement, I don't know. I don't believe so. Um, we don't have an official statement on this, do we, Kim? No, no, uh, not at the moment, but it may be something that your your task force can review. Well, it's something that we could, we could also, we could also consider in the task force, but we could also consider it as an association. Um, uh, the answer is no, we haven't officially endorsed it. Uh, it'll probably be something that uh, comes up in the discussion of the task force. Uh, I have to admit that earlier today, I gave a presidential address at the Western Political Science Association meeting, and the same issue came up about uh, supporting ethnic studies across the curriculum. And I, I in principle, am supportive. Uh, I will have to discuss this with my task force as to how exactly we operationalize this. Uh, by the way, I. I hate, I'm remiss to, or I hate to promise too much because I see this as a beginning and that, you know, I can't say we're going to do this and this and this. And at the end of the day, after one year, all of it, everything will be fixed because it won't be. What I see as a task force is a beginning that we start to have a coherent conversation discipline wide as to what we think our students should know and how we prepare our PhDs to teach those things that we think they should know. So, yeah, I, I can't promise specific things at this point. I can only say that we're going to start the process and then we'll see where it leads. And I expect all of you to voice your, put your input into that process. Thank you, John. And the final question for this evening is from uh, Dr. Andra Gillespie. Um, Andra says, John, I spend a lot of time dealing with methodological fights in the discipline. And these are important for us, but they have consequences for undergraduate pedagogy, public scholarship, and civic engagement generally. What is your vision for the proper relationship between methods and substantive political science? Well, I've always thought of methods as a toolbox. You know, it's like, I, I, this question, a sort of related question came out earlier when I was addressing the WPSA. You know, sometimes I think that we focus on methods, and I'm not sure I'm getting at Andre's question, but sometimes I think we focus on method because it's neutral, that we don't have to take a stand on anything. And it's easier to talk about uh, coefficients and t-tests and goodness of fit measures, because then you don't have to take a stand. Uh, you don't have to be political. You don't have to make a statement. You don't have to do something to make life better. Uh, and I was part of that generation. Uh, I think that's why we tend to focus on these methodological debates. Frankly, I think the methodological debates are trivial. I think that it amounts to being saying that I will study the hammer, but actually the hammer is not meant to be studied. It's actually meant to be used. Uh, so that's what I, I, I think that the proper relationship between methods and substance is that substance should always take the forefront. Methods are tools. We deal with substance, we deal with problems. We try to figure out ways to address those problems and our tools help us do it. I, I actually, you know, I understand there are some serious debates over methods, uh, uh, but I'll tell you, I find them rather tiresome and distracting. 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Ushiyama. I, this concludes our session. Um, I'd, I'd like to also just thank the, um, the founders panel. Uh, and again, it was a wonderful and informative panel. And also I'd like to thank um, Johnny Shiyama for his remarks. Uh, if there are any other remarks to close out the session from the INCOPES team, um, I will yield the floor. Okay, it looks like we're all good. Thank you so much. Have a good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for having me and enjoy the rest of your conference.